so a little bit about who we are. Um, we're the Greater Quabbin Food Alliance, and um, I, I am Amy Donovan, and I'm with the Franklin County Solid Waste Management District. Uh, my co-collaborator on this webinar and many other things is Joel Betts. Give us a wave, Joel, in case anybody hasn't seen you. <laughs> uh, he is a conservation planner with the uh, Worcester County Conservation District. And um, they're doing great work with soil testing, composting, all kinds of great stuff out there in Worcester. So check out their website. We have other members of our group that are not um, visible to us right now, or maybe not on the webinar, but they have been crucial uh, in getting this webinar and many other projects together. So we are a great working group of different organizations and individuals working together, um, just really to increase uh, knowledge of awareness of composting in the greater Quabbin area and beyond. So one of our um, stalwart centerpieces of our little group here is the Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust. And they created the Greater Quabbin Food Alliance um, probably in, I think it was probably 2014 or 15 to bring together folks from across the region to talk about all kinds of issues around local food production, um, encouraging it, selling it, wasting less, all kinds of great topics. So um, you can check us out on the web, the Greater Quabbin Food Alliance or Mount Grace Land Conservation Trust. Uh, we also have Clearview Composting represented. Hopefully Rick Inez will be joining us by phone. He is um, a masterful composter with a wonderful facility in Orange Mass called Clearview Composting. And he's a true composting expert, much more so than Joel and I, but we will, we, I've been composting for 25 years, but I'm still not at the level of Rick Inez, that's for sure. Um, we also have represented, representatives on our group from Drawdown Montague, which is a group in Montague working to um, in, instill easy ways to combat climate change. We have Seeds of Solidarity Education Center. These are the folks that put on the famous Garlic and Arts Festival. Um, so Deb Habib has been a long time member of our group. And then last but not least, we have Recycling Works in Massachusetts, which is a wonderful website we will provide at the end where anybody can go on and find a compost hauler or recycling hauler for, um, it's mostly geared toward businesses and organizations, but anybody can use this website. And there's just a treasure trove of information on there. So, so check that out too. Um, <clears throat> going back one sec here, I just wanna point out that it is International Compost Awareness Week. So I'm so glad that um, so many people have joined us uh, to learn more about composting and to fine tune their compost programs um, or bins or systems that they have at their house. Um, Joel, how many people are with us tonight? We've got 45 people. 45 people, nice. Yeah, thank you for joining everyone. Thank you everybody, this is awesome. So I'm gonna jump in, anything else to say, Joel? I think we're good, yeah, let's jump okay. into the, the content. Okay, um, so, when we talk about why to compost or recycle, um, I go, my mind goes right into trash production. So in my work with Franklin County Solid Waste District, I'm always trying to, you know, reduce the amount of trash in our, our member towns and beyond schools, uh, organizations, businesses, events, you name it. Um, reducing trash is a really good idea for anybody. Um, one reason is because it is very expensive to dispose of trash um, and it is only going to get more expensive in the coming years. Um, when we put trash in a landfill, it does not become soil. Uh, when we send trash to um, an incinerator or waste combustor, it does not become soil. It does create energy, so that's kind of good. Um, and so a lot of people are focused on landfills. Um, so I wanna make sure that people understand that in about six years, we won't have any uh, landfills for municipal solid waste left in our state of Massachusetts. And um, the, sta the state of Massachusetts is not planning on building any more 
Um, there's various reasons for that that we don't have time to go into today. Um, but we need to reduce, reuse, and recycle and compost as much as we can. Um, so um, of our trash that goes to the incinerators around the state, um, 22 to 28%, depending on what site you're at, is compostable food waste. So there's a lot in our trash still that can be composted, that can be diverted from disposal. And so there's a lot more work to be done. Even though we have 45 conscientious uh, composters on this call, and I think the poll will show us that a lot of people on this call already do compost, um, there's a lot of people that can't compost, that, that don't compost for whatever reason, and there's probably a lot of good reasons. So it behooves all of us to have our businesses, schools, towns, anybody who can to, to divert that material from the trash. Um, the, the waste combustor that's down in the Springfield area is called Community Eco Power. Um, it is a waste energy facility that makes energy from burning uh, municipal solid waste. And some people might say, well, that's a great solution for our trash problem. And, and it is a solution. Um, it's not perfect or without controversy, but again, I'm not gonna get into that today, but I am going to say um, um, that it's a capacity. Uh, 400 tons a day is what they're allowed to take in. And um, you know they, they get filled up uh, with the towns from around the region. So they can't even accept waste from like trash haulers and, um, people that don't have a contract, it's contracted from municipalities in Western Mass. So it's already pretty much all filled up. If we reduce waste, then there'll be more space for trash haulers and uh, private contractors to bring in trash. But um, as it is right now, it is oversubscribed or at capacity. So we need to reduce, we need to reduce trash. And one great way of doing that is by composting. And now I'm going to turn it over to Joel. Thanks, Amy. And thanks everyone for being here. Um, so one another reason to compost um, is that it builds soil health and really helps out our gardens. Um, and a lot of people on here, I should have added that as a poll question, but a lot of people on here are probably also gardeners. Um, and there's a couple of reasons that it builds soil health. One is that it inoculates soil with organic matter and beneficial bacteria, fungi, nematodes, other microorganisms, arthropods. You can see there in those pictures, you know, a little bit of what that looks like. That uh, organic matter, which is what compost is made up of, is the, the most important component of soil health because it's the base of the food chain. So you can see, you know, the things that are smallest, like the microorganisms feed the larger organisms, which then feed the whole ecosystem. And that keeps our soil healthy. Um, you can go to the next slide. Can you see this box that's in the middle of my screen right now? No, I think Okay, good. you can get rid of that. Okay, it's just yep. saying admit people. I didn't know if it was showing oh, I'll up do on that. the screen. Yep. <laughs> so, I um, admitted them, we're good. Great. So, um, you know, healthy soil with higher organic matter from compost grows healthy plants. So a higher biological activity improves soil structure which helps for root penetration. You know, you get with better soil structure due to more organic matter and, and, and earthworms and other smaller things doing their work. Um, you get more aggregate stability. You've got, you know, pores in the soil that allows for water um, and nutrient retention, as well as, you know, root penetration and um, kind of a, a living spaces in the, in the soil for living things to be, as well as, you know, the organic matter provides the food for those organisms. Uh, so compost also adds its own nutrients and minerals, um, which are caught up in the organic matter, as opposed to fertilizers, which are purely a chemical that you're adding. Um, compost has that, um, you know, allows for, as it biodegrades further, allows for those nutrients to become accessible to plants over time, which is, you know, a, a more, less of a flash, kind of addition of nutrients and it's a more gradual um, accessibility of nutrients for your plants. So really compost is garden gold. Um, and you know that's one main main reason why to compost, right? As you get this great product that would probably cost a lot at the store and not be as good as what you can produce at site, on site. Next slide. 
Another reason is that composting reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot of you have probably seen this, but just to review quickly, um, climate change is caused by greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere due to the greenhouse effect. So um, CFCs, nitrous oxide, methane, and um, in particular carbon dioxide are, you know, serve as a really important and crucial warming gas layer in our atmosphere. But as we add to those above natural levels, too much heat gets retained, um, as shown by that picture, and, and we get unnatural warming of the Earth. Um, and so next slide. So composting helps slow climate change um, on the small scale in that it actually captures carbon from food and organic waste and fixes it into the soil. So you know those, that carbon dioxide that would be going from uh, our food waste when it, when it or, or as, as methane or carbon dioxide from a landfill actually gets captured into the soil when you use compost. And you can see on the left, there's, there's a high carbon content soil versus on the right, a low carbon content soil. And you can even see, you know, one soil is much, much healthier than the other, but regardless of how healthy it is, it's holding carbon, keeping it out of the atmosphere. And that's a benefit in terms of climate change. And if we can scale that up and improve our soils through good farming practices and gardening practices, that could go a long way. And the state of Massachusetts actually just put out a healthy soils action plan to try to get landowners to do more um, with increasing organic matter in their soils. Next slide. Hold on, I got to write down healthy soils action plan. Yeah, that should be available pretty soon. <laughs> I was on that working group um, for nice. the state and it, it should be coming out to the public pretty soon. So keep an eye out for that. Great. Thanks for that work. Yeah. Um, and Another reason why composting helps slow climate change is that it reduces the amount of organic matter put into landfills, which reduces methane emissions. Um, so when organically based materials, such as food waste or paper decay in a landfill, a lot of it's released as methane. And methane is a greenhouse gas that's 23, 23 times more powerful than carbon dioxide because it's not fully broken down. It's, do, you know, it's, not, um, it's, a, it's just a more potent um, heat absorber in the atmosphere. And in a, in a landfill context, there's not enough oxygen because you're not getting stirring. There's all this piling of things. So you, you, carbon tends to break down into methane instead of carbon dioxide, which um, per carbon molecule is much more potent. Um, so that's a really big problem. Um, methane emissions need to be reduced as much as possible. So when you compost, you prevent methane from being created in landfills. Next slide. Okay, and then also some models say that methane is 80 times more potent than carbon um, as a greenhouse gas. So it depends on what kind of model you're looking at and what time of, what um, time period. Um, but yeah. we, we use 23 just to be safe. Yeah, and how long it takes to, <laughs> to biodegrade in the atmosphere and things like that, totally. Exactly. Um, so you might say, as I did when I learned about this, why doesn't composting release methane? And that's because oxygen is part of the composting process. Uh, a landfill uh, compresses, literally compresses the material inside and uh, there's no oxygen as part of the design. Um, so that's what creates the methane. There's a set of bacteria there that's creating the methane. And then in an, anaero in an aerobic environment like a compost bin or a compost farm, um, you're introducing oxygen, you're allowing air to be in there, and there's a different set of bacteria that don't create the same type of methane or, or don't create methane at all. Um, or if they do, it's a small amount. So um, this is a picture of Martin's farm in Greenfield. And I love this picture because it shows um, the windrow turner going through those piles of compostables known as windrows. And um, it adds moisture and it has a, a, like a giant screw that is going through the middle of that pile. And that is the action that's really adding oxygen because it's mixing up, it's fluffing up the material in those piles. So similarly in your home compost bin or system, uh, if it's a manufactured bin, it has holes and aeration that's designed to let air flow through that system. Or if you build a system, um, it should have holes or slats or something to allow air to flow through. And that way you will have an, an aerobic process there that won't release methane and the smells that come along with methane are pretty bad. So, you'll be avoiding that also. 
Um, so a little bit about Martin's Farm. Uh, it accepts um, food waste and paper waste from, in normal non-COVID times, 26 Franklin County schools, plus markets like Big Y, cooperatives, um, uh, health food stores, uh, restaurants, and eight municipal compost programs that are at transfer stations. And the reason that they can accept so much volume of material is actually because of the volume and the professional ways that they manage the material. And on the left side of the screen, uh, you can see a compost thermometer. I took that picture um, when Adam Martin sunk that, you know, three foot long thermometer into the middle of that pile or a pile. And it went right up to 140 degrees and it should stay at 150 to 160 or so uh, for at least five days in order to be um, uh, safe for use and in order to kill weed seeds and such. So this is really a, a very um, effective form of hot composting at Martin's Farm. And I'll show you a little bit about more about that in a moment. So another reason to compost is it saves money. Um, if you live in Franklin County, Massachusetts or in many towns in Massachusetts or beyond, you might have to buy special trash bags put your trash out by the curb or bring it to a municipal transfer station. And whatever you can keep out of that trash bag is going to save you money. So recycling um, your all your paper and cardboard, your cans, bottles, containers, cartons, uh, keeping that out of the trash can um, make for less trash. So this is actually a picture of my home set out in Greenfield and I have, um, one small kitchen bag there that is very, very light and mostly just contains packaging. Um, <laughs> and all my food waste, th that bag doesn't contain any food waste. And there's rarely any food waste in my home trash. And I'll show you how in a moment. <clears throat> but you can see I have more recycling than trash, which is the goal. Um, so you can save money for your family by doing that, by using less of those trash bags or stickers that are required by your town. You can save money for your town because trash disposal is very expensive and it is measured by weight. Uh, food waste is heavy. So if you're gonna get that 22 to 28% of what's in you know, general Massachusetts trash out of there, um, you're gonna be saving money for your municipality. And then um, this one's a little bit more um, subtle, but if you're one of those people that goes out and buys bags and bags of bagged topsoil fertilizers and garden soil um, for your property each spring, um, you can re you know, save money there by making your own compost instead of buying some of these materials. Um, and it is notable that those bags are not recyclable. Um, they're not accepted in the store plastic bag recycling programs. Plastic bags are never accepted in um, household, hold, municipal or commercial recycling. So, you know, those bags of soil are really creating more trash um, because they have to be thrown away. Um, and then you can also buy, by the way, you can buy unbagged you know, bulk compost from places like Martin's Farm and Clearview Composting. And I'm sure people have a place near them, maybe a landscaping company that has um, finished compost for sale. And you can go there with, with your truck or with um, a couple big recycling bins, um, empty of recycling um, for that day and uh, have them fill up those containers with um, unbagged compost. You can do that also. Or to interrupt, one one thing in Worcester, the city compost is also um, usually free, and you can you can get that at certain places in the city, or or you know I could connect you with that as well. So like from the municipality, from like the municipality, they, they made it from their leaves yep. that they collected and their trees that they um, chipped up. So they the municipality offers it for free. Yeah, in Worcester, so that's a so great idea. It's great. Yeah, a lot of towns do that. Okay, so when we talk about composting, I like to break it down into three different sizes. And those sizes become important because when you're talking about what to put in the compost, how to manage it, and like how much to put in there, um, 
it if you go from small to large as you go up in size you can put more types of materials you can um, uh, do a wider range of materials in there and have um, more finished product uh, and more volume in there so starting with the smallest in my opinion very special way of composting um, an indoor or outdoor, although I prefer indoor and I teach how to do indoor, worm compost bin uses red wiggler worms, also known as red worms or Asenia fetida. And um, this is a very small system. I have a picture here of a classroom worm bin that stays indoors. If you do it right, it doesn't smell. Um, and it accepts kind of a limited range of food waste. I really only recommend putting in raw vegetables and fruits. Um, some people put in breads and, and other things. And I, I just feel like um, it's a small system. So problems can, can occur a little more easily than, a, than an outdoor bin. So to keep it pure, um, I just do raw vegetables, raw fruits, coffee grounds and eggshells. Um, and for that indoor bin, you know, or even if you do it outdoors, it's not recommended to put meat, cheese, um, animal products, oily foods, uh, peanut butter, salad dressing, because that bin is just too small to handle those and break down that material. You might end up with odors and pests, but otherwise it's very easy. And um, we, as I said at the beginning, we are offering another webinar a week from today about worm composting. And we will have that information at the end. Um, and this, the same way that you signed up for this, um, like if you saw an article in the newspaper or on Facebook, the other links should be there next to it. And we, we should make sure that, um, that they are there, Joel, maybe on the Facebook page. Um, Okay, so that's the smallest kind of composting in my, in my little world here of three sizes. The next size is medium sized backyard or on site composting, which we're about to go more in depth on. And into these systems, it could be a plastic bin, like you see the picture of there, or it could be a pallet or even a pile, a, a pallet bin that you make yourself, or um, a rotating bin, a tumbler. Um, in these bins, we can accept a wider amount of uh, food waste, such as breads of any kind, like rice, grains. If you're cleaning out your closets or have cabinet moths, you can, you know, um, make a little bin in your kitchen and, and, and add all those packages, recycle the boxes and the cans, um, and um, recycle any kinds of grains, um, cereals, that kind of thing also. Um, also, we definitely recommend, it's practically required that you put leaves in these bins and garden wastes. Um, but still, same thing as the small worm bin. We don't recommend that you put meat, animal products, cheese, oils, or peanut butter into backyard composting programs. And then the large type of composting, commercial composting. Hopefully you're hearing more and more about this in your communities um, because it is becoming very widely available. Um, this type of composting, because as I explained about the thermometer, it gets so hot because of the volumes and the microorganisms that are working in those piles. Um, these type, kinds of programs can accept any kinds of food um, as long as it's solid food. Liquids just don't really work out for collection. Um, but you can put meat, bones, dairy, um, cheese, yogurt, sour cream, salad dressing, um, fry a later oily bits at the end of the night at a restaurant, any kind of food, as long as it's not liquid. It could be raw, it could be bad, it could be good, it could be a turkey carcass, it can go in there. Um, and then it can accept paper, paper napkins, paper towels, takeout containers, egg cartons, wax cardboard. And some places that accept this material ch chip it all up um, to make it all into smaller pieces. And that really helps with that. Um, and then there's another group of materials that can go in here, which is um, compostable plastics. 
um, and paper products that are a little more like engineered to be composted. And all of those types of kind of newer materials should be BPI certified. And that is a third party certification that just says, yes, this product, this, um, this plate or coffee cup or a plastic fork that's made out of corn is really compostable in an environment like this. And we have certified it so. So you can look at that website, which I thought I had on here, but I guess I don't, um, is bpiworld.org. Uh, maybe we have it at the end. I think we might have this in, oh wait, it might be in the, the business uh, webinar presentation, uh, but it's bpiworld.org. So this kind of composting is perfect for a school or a restaurant, a business that has a significant amount of food waste. And you can find out more at that website that I alluded to in the beginning, which is recyclingworksma.org. And so you can find a, a hauler or a composter. Um, and uh, you can also measure how much food waste an average school of your size would have. Um, so there's a lot of tools on that great website. Um, one more bit about this slide. Um, the, these are windrows at Bear Path Farm in Waitley, Mass. And that is taken in like the cold months in the winter. You can see some frost in the background. And there's actually steam coming off those piles because it is so hot inside those windrows. So home compost bins are usually not large enough to get this hot, nowhere near this hot, um, but that's okay. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, <clears throat> the transfer stations in Franklin County are, um, I think 54% of them now uh, have compost containers similar to this one in Montague, Mass. Um, there are also programs like this in Northampton and Amherst um, and the North Shore of Boston and other towns on the eastern part of Massachusetts are um, experiencing a lot of great success with curbside pickup of food waste. We don't have any curbside pickups of food waste in any towns in Western Mass. In all four counties of Western Mass, there are no curbside pickups that are from a municipality. You can get a private hauler to come and pick up at your curb, but you'll be paying for that out of pocket. But if you can do that, do that, it's great. Um, I just want to show the difference between some of these types of municipal programs. Um, so it's the same type of um, yes, no list. And this container is emptied once a week and brought to a local facility like Martin's Farm or Clearview Composting. Um, and if you want to start a program like this for your town, um, I could give you some tips or you could, well, I, you could come to the business workshop that we're doing on May 18th, but you could also just email me and my email is going to be at the end. Um, okay, I'm going right. to hand it over to Joel and take a sip of water. Thanks, Amy. Um, so a little bit more into the nitty gritty. How does home composting work? Um, so any scale of compost, compost system needs these key features uh, or ingredients. First is water. Um, material in a bin should be as damp and as wrung out as about, you know, as a wrung out sponge. Um, and you should add water if not when building a pile. But, you know, you don't want to add too much water, but usually that's not uh, people's issue, but you want to make sure to keep it damp, but not soaked. If it's been rainy, you don't need to add water, but in the hot summer months when it hasn't rained for a while and when you're turning it, it may be helpful to, to dampen it just with a watering container or something like that. Um, and then in the winter, because there's so much, uh, there's so little ev evaporation, things are frozen. Hopefully they're not totally frozen because you've got some heat in your compost pile, um, but you definitely don't need to add as much or any water depending on where you live and, and um, what's going on in your pile. And then the other key ingredient or another key ingredient is air. Because oxygen, as we mentioned before, is a key part of the composting process. So you want to make sure to mix and stir um, your, your pile occasionally. Um, at least, I, I, I don't know what Amy's rule of thumb is, I, I would say at least every other week, at least once a month uh, at the minimum. Um, but I try to do it every other week so that you, you know, the more often you do it, the faster you're going to have a finished compost product because oxygen, uh, getting oxygen in there helps feed those microorganisms that need it. 
um, to um, to to decompose and to turn things into um, into organic matter and carbon dioxide and produce that heat that speeds it up. Um, and then the other key component that uh, is really important is you've got to get your ratio correct um, of carbon rich and nitrogen rich materials. So we call it brown and green materials. And I'll have a list of what those are. Um, but you want to get about three parts carbon to one part nitrogen rich materials. Um, and the next slide will be about that. And then the other thing is microorganisms. Typically, if your compost pile is outside on the soil, you've got a natural place for earthworms and much smaller microorganisms to enter. But it doesn't hurt to add a bit of um, soil or compost to a new pile to kind of jumpstart that biotic activity. Um, you know, if you've got a compost pile on concrete or if you're doing vermicomposting, you know, some of that, some of those microorganisms will come from the food waste itself, but it's helpful to add a little bit of soil or a little bit of compost from an active pile to kind of jumpstart it. Um, next slide. So when we're talking about brown and green materials or nitrogen rich and carbon rich materials, um, things you can compost at home in those categories are, uh, you know, typically scraps of veggies, fruit, peels, all of that, um, you know, your bread, rice, pasta, and grains, as long as they're not too saturated with oil. Um, coffee grounds, even though they're brown, are actually considered a green material because they're super rich in nitrogen and other material and other um, uh, nutrients. Um, paper coffee filters, because they've been saturated in grounds, tea bags, anything that has, um, you know, that's, that's used like that. Um, and then eggshells, which are also really high in calcium, um, can be used. It's the, you know, the more you break those up, the better they're going to compost down, the more accessible they'll be to your plants. Um, they're one of the things to slow, to go more slowly. And then grass clippings are considered a green material and, and some yard waste, um, even though a lot of people think of that as kind of a more inert material because we typically fertilizer lawns and because they go into the pile green, uh, there's often quite a bit of nitrogen in those, um, in those materials. Um, and then, you know, other things that could be considered um, green material, I suppose manure um, could fit in that category, but there's kind of more complexities to that that we won't get into. We could get into it in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, and then a few brown materials. Um, your best option and most accessible thing is fall leaves. Um, another, you know, some people mulch with straw. Um, that's a good thing. Add that after you pull it off your garden in the spring. Um, a great option uh, is shredded newspaper or paper. If you've got a paper shredder, you can add that right to there. Most of our inks are soy-based now. It should be fine to add those to, uh, um, to your compost pile. Um, paper egg cartons, make sure you tear them up. Same with cardboard. Um, those are great sources of brown material. These are all really high in carbon, low in nutrients, um, so they balance it out. Um, wood chips, although the smaller the better, and you don't want to add too many because they take a long time to biodegrade. Um, but I, my favorite and what I didn't realize was um, paper towels and napkins. We use, you know, a couple paper towels each a day in my house. And <laughs> that's something you can, you can add, you know, it's got a little bit of food waste on it. Um, but I just toss all of my paper towels and napkins and Kleenexes and all that in there. Um, so uh, I think that's a decent option for people. And then old potting soil, dead plants, making sure that you're not adding disease stuff if you're trying to grow those same plants in it in the future. Um, and then animal bedding um, is a decent one as well, although you want to make sure that you leave it in the pile long enough if it has any potential, you know, E. coli or bacteria, things like that, similar to manure. And then, as Amy said, you want to avoid meat, fish, bones, cheese, dairy, anything with a lot of fat and grease and oil. Um, cooked foods with lots of butter or oils, you know, other cooked foods are fine, but if it's high in oil, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, or if it has meat in it. And then you want to try to avoid insect and disease-ridden things, you know, if you've got uh, or and as well as weeds and invasive plants, you know, if you don't if you don't want it in your garden, don't put it in your compost. If you're going to use your compost in your garden, it's better to put that in a separate pile or in a municipal waste or something like that. You know, we have a, Japanese knotweed is a great example of one that's not good to put in your compost pile because any fragment, basically, will be you'll start growing Japanese knotweed in your compost pile, and you don't want that. Um, so uh, that's you know, there's a lot there. Um, but that's some basic rules for you. And you want to get that ratio at about three to one, three brown to one green. Next slide. So Okay. And um, this, well, I was just going to mention one thing, Amy. Yes. Uh, yeah. I noticed, so the state has a lot of great resources on this, and this is pretty similar to our previous um, 
to, to what we just talked about. So we won't go through it in detail, but I noticed that Anne McGovern from the state is online on our webinar and she she just offered to join our Q&A panel. Um, she manages a lot of this and, and probably made this, I would guess, uh, yes, made this diagram. <laughs> so um, she's going to be able to elaborate on some of that through the Q&A panel, but I wanted to let Amy know about that. Nice. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you. you Anne. <laughs> Thanks, sure, thanks, thanks for all your work sharing this info. Much appreciated. Oh, Thank you, Anne. You're the trailblazer here. Um, so I just wanted to say one thing about weeds with seeds on this last slide. Um, in the spring, the weeds don't have seeds yet, most of them. Um, so it's a good time to compost weeds. Um, because if they don't have seeds and they don't spread with runners, you can compost them and they probably won't survive. And if they do survive a little bit, you can just pull them out and put them back in there. Um, and eventually uh, they will compost. Um, okay, so I'm a weirdo. And every time I go to somebody's house, they have a compost bin. I say, oh, can I look in your compost bin? And I go over and I open it up and oh, um, <laughs> I always find, I'm sorry to say, that people don't have enough leaves in their compost bins. Um, now, I have been pleasantly surprised a few times. I don't want to sound like a jerk, but um, most times I find that people don't have enough brown materials. Um, I call them leaves because they're usually leaves in this area, but it could be other materials also. Like Joel just covered, um, you can... Uh, newspaper is often made with um, soy-based, water-based, or carbon-based inks, however you want to call it, and you could easily tear up newspaper and put that in your compost as a carbon source. Um, pine needles um, are okay to compost, but they're a little bit acidic and they take a long time to compost, so they shouldn't make up 10, uh, more than 10% of the material in your pile. Um, I I personally don't like composting oak leaves. I think they take a long time to break down because of the tannins in them. They're very tough. Some people, if they have a hot compost bin, have plenty of luck with oak leaves, but I prefer maple and other kinds of leaves. Um, and you can stockpile your leaves um, in the fall in a covered trash can or tarp so that you always have a supply of leaves. Um, so, three parts browns to one parts greens. Now you'll read a lot of different things about the ratios of carbon to nitrogen and Anne and the smart people at MassDEP and the other people that um, you know she based this work on um, came up with this formula, three parts browns to one part greens because different, um, like all the materials that were on the previous slide, they contain nitrogen and carbon, but if you keep it to this recipe, you don't have to worry about all those various um, ratios. Just make sure you have a lot more browns than you do greens. And so when you're setting up your bin, you can mix, um, you can layer the materials. So you're, you're gonna have more brown layers than green layers, or, the, or the, the layers are gonna be thicker for the browns so that you have more browns than greens. And that really helps with odor too. Um, there's a, a myriad of uh, benefits to having a lot of leaves or bulking materials in your compost bin or pile. Um, and then under number two there, it says um, mix or layer materials. So when I first started composting, I always heard about the layers and then I soon realized, oh, the layers are all about just getting that correct ratio and making sure that the materials are mixed um, once you mix up that bin for the first time, boom, there go your layers that you so carefully created. So you don't have to worry about the layers so much. Um, I tell people who seem a little rushed to begin, well, just fill your bin up with leaves and then add your food waste as you go. And you could also add the water and the other things also. But um, if, you're, if you're in a hurry, just make sure you got a lot of leaves in there. So underneath number two, it says, after every 12 inches or so, add a few shovelfuls of rich soil or compost. This is a very important piece because this is going to inoculate your bin with the microorganisms, or, organisms, bacteria and fungi that are needed to um, like get the material really cooking. 
Um, the worms will find it, the other bacteria and microorganisms will find it, but by adding a little shovelful here and there, a few shovelfuls um, every 12 inches or so when you're building your pile, um, you will help that bin out a lot. Now, if you have a pile at home that is sluggish, you could try inoculating it with some um, nice compost from a friend's bin or um, rich garden soil or even some soil from the woods would add some critters that would get that cooking. Um, number three says, keep it damp and aerated. That means add water when needed to keep it the moisture level of a wrung out sponge and stir it uh, once in a while. Um, and fluff it up when you stir it. It's not that you're trying to move, you have your bin, you're not trying to move everything on this side over to this side, and this has got to go over here, and this has got to go over here, especially if you don't have a lot of physical strength to stir a compost pile. All you need to do is get some air into there. So you could dig a little hole here, dig a little hole there. You could even take a broom handle um, and make holes or like a, like a a more sharp piece of metal or like a driveway marker or something like that, just to get some air holes in there. You don't want it to compact. You want it to get um, air to be able to move through there. Um, and so this wonderful resource is on the MassDEP website and it's a fabulous one page handout. Thank you, Anne. Um, okay, so when you're setting up your bin, um, like I said, you're going to add leaves or brown materials um, to start. Now, some people put um, like sticks and coarse materials on the bottom of a bin. And this, this is a great technique, especially if you're gonna have a bin that's like um, built out of pallets or something like that. And we do have some instructions coming up for that. Um, but I find in this smaller bin, the earth machine, that those coarse materials on the bottom kind of get in my way of mixing it. Um, but if you're the kind of person that's not gonna mix it up much at all, sure, if you have some sticks, break them up and put them in the bottom so that um, that will add some air holes for air to move through the bottom. Um, so when you're first building your pile, start out with a nice brown layer, a nice carbon rich brown material layer. Um, add some finished compost or soil um, to inoculate the bin, then add your green materials and then just keep going, remembering to add more brown than green materials. Um, top off your pile or your bin with brown material. And um, for the water, you could either, you know, just get a hose with a nice sprayer and wet each layer as you're building it. That's a really good way to do it or you could just, just stand there with the hose or let the hose run here and there in different parts of the bin um, at a slow trickle and wet the, wet the whole pile that way. Um, and in this picture, by the way, <laughs> what's that third picture? That is, those are pumpkins that I went around and collected in my yard at the end of the fall and then it rained and it got very wet. So that container was adding green material, nitrogen rich material in the form of pumpkins and gourds. And then the water was adding the water. So I was kind of doing two for one there. Um, so when you're getting ready to set up a new bin, um, I say assemble everything you're gonna need and um, a friend and set it up in one um, session so that you get it done. Um, I say place it in an easily accessible place because I see some people's compost bins that are like way out behind their house. And I'm like, are you really going to walk all that way with your little container or is it going to end up in the trash? So I say, keep it easy for yourself and your family members and keep it close, closer to your house than you might think. It's probably never, ever going to smell because you're uh, attending this wonderful webinar 
and you're going to do it right. And you're not going to add meat, bones, or dairy, and it's not going to smell. So you can put it close to your house. Um, if you're worried about ants or anything like that, you don't have to have it right next to your house. Like I have mine right next to my house. You can have it, you know, 20 feet out, 30 feet out, but not 50 yards. That's too far. Um, I say place it in a sunny spot because here we are in New England and um, most of the year is not very warm. And so in order to keep a smaller bin, like some of the ones we're talking about today, hot, um, that sun can kind of help heat up that composting, compost. Um, if anybody is with us from Arizona or New Mexico, maybe you don't want to put your bin in a sunny spot. Um, you want to water your bin and keep it in the shade so that it stays as moist as a wrung out sponge. Um, okay, so like I said, assemble the materials you'll use to start. You want some food waste, you want your brown materials, a shovel or a pitchfork. Um, so a shovel with a pointed end, a spade is what you want. You don't want a shovel with a flat end. That is not gonna do you much good. A pitchfork, a good old fashioned pitchfork of any type is one of the best tools for composting because it's easy to turn the compost, stir it up, make holes in it with that pitchfork. You can buy wonderful compost turners in, in nice garden stores and online. And if you feel like treating yourself to something like that, especially if, you're, if you don't have the physical strength to really stir it. I highly recommend getting something like that because it's kind of fun. Um, there's different styles that you can get and um, you can get one that kind of like screws down into the compost. It's very satisfying. And then there's the type that um, you, put, you put this um, pointed metal stick down into the compost and it has two like butterfly wings that close. And then when you pull it back out again, they open and it creates these air tunnels in the compost. But I really like that one too, it's pretty fun. And then, like I said, you have your, um, that should actually say one to four gallons of finished compost or garden soil, but it says shovelfuls, which is wrong. Uh, <laughs> and then some water. So the other thing is you wanna put your bin in a place where your hose reaches so that if it gets really dry and hot, you can easily add some water um, and I like to add water from my rain barrel um, once in a while, if it's getting full, that's a great way to add water. And I also, when I dump my compost bin, I'll use my rain barrel or my hose to rinse out the little bin from my kitchen and I'll put that dirty water into the compost and therefore I'm not wasting any water. So keep it cooking. Um, this is really important. Each time you add food waste, you're gonna have um, a less icky time if you bury or cover the, the food waste with leaves or other brown materials. So when you open your bin, you should see leaves or brown materials, whether it be straw, newspaper, um, uh, paper towels and napkins, um, and the other things on that list. You wanna see the brown materials. You don't wanna see food waste rotting on the top because that's when you're going to get a lot of insects and um, animals will be more attracted to it if it is more exposed. So you want to kind of, some people call those brown materials bulking agents and you it really helps to kind of dilute the food waste with those leaves and those bulking agents um, and, and, you know, bury the materials with it. Um, you want to stir that pile, um, you know, once a week, once a month, in the warmer months, the more you stir it, the better results you'll have. If it ever smells bad, like ammonia or, you know, rotting food waste, repeat one and two, make sure you're burying the food waste, make sure you have lots of brown materials and keep stirring it up and it will compost. Um, when the compost is finished, it will look and smell like clean, fresh, crumbly soil and it will be dark and rich color like in that picture. Um, oh, like in that picture, there, there we are. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about cold composting versus hot composting. Okay, so most of the bins that we use are too small 
to um, really generate a lot of heat. So um, if you're expecting that bin to really heat up, you know, don't be too disappointed. It's probably not big enough to do that. Um, the gentleman in the picture on the right, it looks like he might be getting some steam coming off of his bin, which is great. He's got a pile that looks like it's almost three feet by three feet by three feet. And that's the size you need if you want hot composting. You don't have to do hot composting in order to feel like you're composting. You're still breaking down food waste. You're still using leaves and food waste to improve your soil. Um, but if you want to like re be really professional about it and really like go for it, sure, build a larger pile, um, you know, in a bin that's uh, wooden is a really good way to do it. Um, if you have a tractor and can, can say no bin, it's just a pile, go for it. Um, if you can maintain that, go for it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, it is doable, but you're probably not gonna get too hot of a bin um, in a regular home composting system. It might freeze in the winter, that's okay. As soon as it starts to thaw in the spring, get out there and stir it, poke some holes in there, try to turn some materials around and you will get some good results. It will start composting very rapidly. Um, so if you have a kitchen pail in your kitchen um, and it is easy to use and everyone in your family knows that's the compost pail, in other words, not a little container that's stowed away in the freezer, but something that everybody knows is there, it's big enough for people to use in your family or your, your housemates, whoever, um, it really makes it a lot easier. So. There are lots of really fabulous compost pails out there in the market. Um, this plastic compost pail is an effort to make it really affordable for everybody. Um, it is only uh, $4.85 for the municipalities to purchase these. So many towns have gone through my organization, Franklin County Solid Waste District, and we uh, coordinate a large purchase each spring. And so um, if your town doesn't have this exact pail, your town might have another compost pail that they have for sale. And this one that's called Sure Clothes is available online. You can probably get it on Amazon, I think, for about 18 to $25. Um, but as you can see, the towns are getting it for a really good price. Um, so Franklin County Solid Waste District sells this to towns um, through our Greenfield offices. You need to call and make an appointment to get a bin. Um, Worcester County Conservation District can connect you um, through your town. Um, these towns that are sh shown have these compost pails. They get them through actually Franklin County Solid Waste. Um, so your town might might have something like this and your town can get uh, composting equipment um, uh, and pay for it with MassDEP uh, rewards points. And you can ask me about that. But a lot of these materials are on state contract. This one in particular is not on state contract yet, but towns can buy compost pails, a couple different styles uh, on state contract um, and actually reimburse themselves with their free mass DEP rewards money. So it's really a win-win. Um, if you're concerned about plastic, I gotcha. This green pail actually has 65% recycled content. Um, the beige one that's shown on the left has 35% <coughs> recycled content and it is technically recyclable. It's number two HDPE plastic. Um, it has a filter in the lid, but the lid closes tight. I like this because it eliminates odors, but it's not like a filter that you have to remember like, oh, I have to buy that filter and where did I get it from again? That's not necessary. The filter is integrated into the lid. Okay, Joel, go for it. Thanks, Amy. Um, so, uh, there's a couple different bin types available to most towns and to most, um, uh, I guess, yeah, just to, to everybody. Um, but in Franklin County, um, you can buy bins at cost. Um, this earth machine is widely available um, through Amy's organization. And um, it's, as you can see the dimensions there, it's available discounted in many towns and I'm sure would have a new updated list. Maybe she can put that in the chat. Of, of which, you know, where we can ask about that in the Q&A of which towns currently offer these. 
um, at discount. Um, and then, you know, we can, you can also reach out to Amy or I, and we can try to figure out uh, for you which, uh, where you could get something like that from your town. Um, also, um, our conservation district sells these lobster trap bins. Um, they're $16 per panel. Um, it's one meter tall, one meter wide. And the idea is to have something that's easier to aerate, um, but keeps raccoons and, and chipmunks and other things out. And most, most of your larger critters out at least. Um, it wouldn't keep a bear out. If you've got bears, that's a different issue. It's hard to keep them out of <laughs> just about anything, but. Um, I have some ideas for that. I have a plan for that. Oh, great. So maybe if you're, if you're curious about that, ask Amy in the Q&A. Um, and so we sell these to Worcester County residents. Um, you can find them on our website um, and order them. And they are super rust proof because they're made out of lobster bin or lobster trap materials. Um, so that's a good option too. And I think even better, next slide, um, make your own. So you can make it from pallets, um, wood, scrap wood, whatever, you know, whatever it is, or if you have more space, just a, an open pile. Um, but we use, I have, a, I have one that looks just like this at home. Um, and, you know, just make sure that your pallets aren't treated. A lot of pallets aren't, but um, you can, there's a little bit about pallet safety in that link. Um, and then there's this really helpful um, YouTube video. Uh, we won't go into the details of how to make one now, but this video will. So you can find that there at that link, um, but pretty straightforward. Um, and that open top, you know, as long as you're burying with your food waste, you know, you might have some animals getting in there, um, but that at least reduces the smell. Um, but oftentimes, if you don't have a top on it, raccoons especially and other things will definitely come by. And that's just whether up to you whether or not you see that as an issue. Next slide. So I guess oh. I'll take this one, Amy, since okay, you've been talking a lot. Um, so one really <laughs> helpful way to go is uh, you can um, make a really simple structure for your leaves, for your brown materials, and then keep them there in the fall, throughout the winter. And then you know, as you need, you can, you can see the earth machine next door, right next to the other one. And as you need, you can put your leaves in there. So I think, you know, a really simple chicken wire circle like that, or, you know, another pallet or just a pile of leaves or something to contain them so they don't blow around. Um, then you have your source of brown materials. Since they all come at once in the fall, it's good to contain them and then, you know, have them ready for when you want to add them to your compost pile um, as kind of your three to one ratio as you add food waste. So I think that's a great quick solution. Next slide. Um, and so to wrap up here, um, you know, you can also, you can scale up or scale down with these different things. If you own a business, um, come to our next one uh, in, in on Tuesday, May 18th, or, or reach out to um, Recycling Works and they can help you, uh, you know, compost at your business. Um, and if you feel like this is too big, you don't have space to grow, or I mean, or to have a compost pile, um, you know, try vermicomposting. Um, basically just with just food waste. Um, and there's some really great ways to do that that we didn't get into tonight that we will next week. And Amy is an expert at that. So um, please join us for the next ones. Next slide. Did you talk about restaurant and business? Yeah, just okay, briefly good. that that will be, we'll be okay. talking about that. Yes, yes. Um, and, you know, definitely the next steps are just to start and improve your own composting operation. Get a bin, get a pail, um, contact us if you need help or contact your town um, and make a note in your calendar in the fall to save your leaves. No need to get those bags of leaves, just um, you know, get something where you, some place where you can keep them and compost them throughout the year. And if, if they pile up, they'll, they'll form the comp compost slowly on their own anyways. So then you'll just have soil that way too. Next slide. So if you want also, in-person technical assistance. Um, if you're a gardener and you want soil testing, you want to learn how to incorporate compost or whether or not you would need to incorporate compost. Um, I do site visits for $50 for a site visit, which includes your first soil sample um, within Worcester County. Um, outside of Worcester County, I can you know follow up by email, but I don't have, a, it's a little far away for me to go from Holden. Um, and we, uh, we can help you with your, uh, through technical assistance one-on-one. -on -one, um, and that's a great way to kind of, start doing this and, and you know figuring out where to put things, where to put a garden, how to set it up, testing for lead, all of that stuff. So that's what I do. Next slide. Fun. I want you to come to my house, but yeah, that'd be great. I'm in Franklin County, so no. Go ahead, okay, Amy. resources. Um, so 
in Franklin County, you can certainly contact me um, if you have questions or want to buy a bin. Um, my our my organization's website is franklincountywastedistrict.org. We have a, a very um, modest but simple composting page with some resources and it lists where you can buy a bin. And if you wanna buy one from our Greenfield office, you have to live in Franklin County. And at this time we do require an appointment um, because we're small staff and you know COVID. Um, on the Franklin County Solid Waste District Facebook page, um, I have some composting um, how-to tutorials. I also have a tutorial on lasagna gardening and that might be a little buried right now. So I will uh, make a note to bring that up because that's another related gardening um, technique, uh, which some people might be interested in. Um, Clearview composting in orange. I don't know if Rick Inez has joined us or not. If you are with us, Rick, let us know. Um, he has a Facebook page also, Clearview Composting, and he accepts leaves for free at his site in Orange and Yard Waste, and he also um, can take in food waste, um, you know, with prior arrangement, and he accepts the food waste from the municipal compost programs in Orange, New Salem, and Wendell. Um, and he's going to be offering some other services too, but he is a really great composting expert. We really rely on him. Um, for businesses and institutions or commercial compost site assistance, you can contact another member of our working group, Christy Smythe Berry, and she works for Recycling Works in Massachusetts. That's that great website I told you about, and there's her email address. And then there are a lot of uh, resources available on mass.gov. If you just go to the Massachusetts website, mass.gov, type in home composting, you will get to some really great resources there, including that, that poster that we love, composting is easy. Um, a big thank you to all of our partners that work with us on this, lots of meetings and um, planning out how to, you know, just get the word out about composting and we couldn't do it without these other organizations that are not represented um, on the screen or are not talking today, but they are represented on the screen. Um, so thank you to all of our friends and colleagues on the Greater Quabbin Food Alliance. Um, and now um, we're gonna go into the um, Q&A session and let's talk about bears first off but joel yeah i think you had sure, something I'll, to say i'll moderate this thanks amy and thank you everyone for being here and i understand if you have to take off but we will get into some interesting interesting discussion and and from uh, from the state has has um said she's willing to stick around and answer questions too which is great um but i want to start by ending our poll here and just kind of uh sharing the results um Looks like 77% of you have a compost bin or pile at home, which is great. Um, most of the rest don't currently compost. So hopefully this will help you know how to get into that. Um, for your main source of brown material, most people use leaves and other yard debris. Not as many people used paper products or cardboard as their main source, but um, now hopefully you know that those are usable. Um, and then about 20% of people uh, didn't use uh, only added food waste or grass clippings. So hopefully you've learned um, how to uh, improve on that and, and improve your compost pile. Um, and then for those who said yes uh, to getting follow-up assistance, we'll send an email after this and feel free uh, or please you know, email us back with specific questions or if you're in Worcester County and want a site visit. Um, so that's just uh, to wrap up that poll. I thought that was pretty interesting um, to have some of those results. Did we have um, another poll question too? No, I think that's it for this one. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we can start the Q&A. Um, Amy, I guess, yeah, go ahead with the bear question and then I'll find, I'll pick and choose some of the okay. unanswered questions from the chat. Okay, good. Okay, so bears, um, it's really hard to bear proof. So um, you just kind of have to prepare for bears. Um, a bear can tear apart uh, one of our plastic compost bins pretty easily. Um, the good news is the top can come off and go right back on. 
<laughs> so um, what I do is I, when the, when the bear is around our neighborhood and, and he or she does come around, um, it's a certain bear that we all the neighbors know about. Um, I kind of check on my compost, make sure there's nothing really smelly in there. I give it a stir. I add some water. So I make sure that it's composting well. The next thing I do is I, I sometimes pause composting for a little while, or I just start using the municipal drop off at Greenfield Transfer Station um, or at Martin's Farm. And I, um, I definitely avoid putting really stinky like fruits in there like um, uh, grapefruit, um, strawberries, uh, watermelon, oh, cantaloupe is so stinky. It smells like garbage, even when it's still good. Um, so things like that, I keep out just for that time when the bear is around. Um, and then, and bears have a, a range of like 50 miles or something, some huge range. So when we had a bear who was visiting last year, he would visit and then we wouldn't see him for a couple of weeks and then he'd be back. And so the neighbors and I have a little text chain where we let each other know if anybody's seen a bear. Um, and then the other thing I do is I have some powdered lime, like limestone, and I sprinkle that around the outside of my compost bin and then on the top, because I've read that bears don't like lime. So they come along sniffling and snuffling like they do, and they get some lime and oh, it repels them. So, <laughs> so that's a really good line of lime of defense. Ha <laughs> ha. Nice. <laughs> so we got some good other questions here thanks amy that's that's helpful yeah um so i am curious um if we could have Anne speak about um those who have chickens and and want to use manure um and then also talk about pet waste because there's a question about pet waste and i have some thoughts on that but i, I would curious maybe Anne, you can speak to that and introduce yourself sure yeah hi thanks so yes, I'm Ann McGovern from the Mass Department of Environmental Protection. And it's great to have Amy and Joel doing this presentation and for everyone that's participating tonight. That's Thanks. great. Joel Thank you, was Amy. asked, sure. Joel was saying we're running late. You can leave if you're busy. I'm like, I could I could talk about composting all night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those weirdos like you guys. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Kindred spirits. That's great. <laughs> um, about chicken manure, it's very high in nitrogen, so it's hot and a little bit stinky, you may know. But uh, it depends on how many chickens you have, because if you have plenty of bedding, then it might not be stinky. So I just say, you, you typical rule of thumb for composting most things, but especially manure, is you want it to compost for a year or more, and that will kill off the pathogens. So we were talking about hot composting. In addition to like Joel and Amy were saying you need a big pile, but not only a big opportunity for a big pile, but you have to have all that material in it at once. <laughs> so that's a trick. You might have a big pallet bin, but you only have a bucket full every few days. So, so you may not get hot compost, but as they said, that's okay. But if you're concerned about wanting to kill things off, time will accomplish the same thing. So a year or more. And then it will also break it down more finely. So you won't need to um, screen it usually it, the older it gets. So um, with chicken manure and horse manure and cow manure, a good rule of thumb is you want it to be a year old if possible. And when you see red wigglers in the horse manure, for instance, it's, they're also called manure worms because they will in, come into a, a, then that means the worm manure is, is safe to use in your garden because it's not heating up enough to kill off the worms. So it's kind of a good sign. Plus you get the worms. And what was the other? Oh, oh pet, pet waste, waste question? Yeah, yeah. I generally Pathogens, go against typically, it, yeah, we recommend herbivore manure, like um, animals that eat the vegetarian animals. <laughs> versus carnivores or even omnivores because the waste from carnivores can harbor pathogens that live at higher temperatures and also maybe can have parasites 
that you could just accidentally get on your finger and then you forgot to wash it and all of a sudden you have tapeworms or something. So, so that's the reason it's best to stay away from composting pet waste if you're going to be using the compost. There is an option where if you have a, a if you have a um, good draining soil, you could dig holes and you could bury your pet waste and it would compost in place. You know, you just don't want to expose yourself to it. So Great, there are thanks. also certain compost um, bins, a couple different kinds that you can get that it, it's not really a compost bin, it's more of a disposal. Uh, one is the solar cone. So you bury this basket in a sunny area and then the part that sticks up above the ground is um, like light green colored and the sun beats on that and it heats up what's happening down underneath and you put things like meat, bones, dog poop, cat poop in there and you never harvest it <laughs> and I mean never. How do you get the basket out? <laughs> How do you get the basket out? Good one. <laughs> so maybe down the line, you get the basket out, you dig it up, but um, you don't use the compost. You don't put this near a well and you don't um, put it next to food crops. Um, it's more of a disposal method. And so the, the one that I like is called solar cone and it's pricey. It's over $150. And then there's another one that's... Um, really targeted for dog waste. And I don't know that the name of that one, um, but some people use that and you have to dig a big hole. Good to know. Yep. You guys are great. It's really nice specific advice on both those fronts. Thanks Amy <laughs> and Dan. Um, I, I wanna go towards a gardening question um, and I guess I'll take a, a shot at it quick. Um, and I'm curious what other folks have, have to say about it. One was, when we add compost to the pot to the garden, should we mix it in or should we leave it on top? Um, and there are definitely mixed um, opinions on this. Um, you know, if you're doing no-till gardening, um, you know, you're not. You would just add it to the top, um, and uh, you know, hopefully and ideally, the worms and other microorganisms would break it in um, as you as the plants grow. They kind of incorporate it. You know, if you're adding a lot at once, I would say, so I guess I do a lot of soil testing for people and make these kinds of recommendations, but you know, I'm still learning as well. So, but I think what I would say is um, if you have really poor soils, like your organic matters below 5% or so, or below 3%, for example, um, and you need a lot of nutrients, I recommend tilling it in, you know, just get it in there get it six, you know, five to six inches deep, get it well mixed. Um, you don't have to till it like crazy, but um, do that initial addition. So you get your organic matter up to above five or 6%, ideally in like the seven to 12% range. Once, you, once you're there, you know, I would say add compost to the top, maybe lightly mix it in when you're planting, but no need to really till intensely because that's when you can start to build your soil health. But you have to have kind of a baseline organic matter and, um, and you know, compost is a great way to get that. Um, before you can kind of start to build that soil health and practice no-till. Any other thoughts on that? I would say that um, I like to put a handful or two of compost in each planting hole if I'm planting totally. something. And I don't have, like if I'm just using my own compost, I don't usually have enough to really spread around. I just use it where I'm planting. Um, so, and then like someone said, if you leave your leaves on the surface, or if you use leaves as mulch, you'll get a similar effect. They'll decompose in, in place and eventually compost in place. So different ways to do it. I don't think any of them are really wrong. Yeah. Whatever kind of works best in your situation. Yep, for sure. And on an agricultural scale, oftentimes people, when they're putting in garlic, for example, or other things, they'll add compost in an inch or two you know, and a lot of that does get broken down and incorporated if you've got healthy soil. Um, you know, if you're adding compost or manure to a field, oftentimes farmers will harrow it in. That's kind of common practice. But, you know, even no-till folks, you know, if you're adding manure, they'll, they'll use injectors and inject it into the soil. There's some pretty cool technology at a larger scale to, to practice no-till while getting things into the soil. Um, but that's not usually the scale people in this call would be at. 
Um, but there's a whole lot of interesting practices out there. Um, I wonder if we can bring up the, the question, and if, or I mean, uh, Amy, if you can go to the beginning where there's the Martin's farm picture, there was a question about um, what people, are, what they were spraying. And I thought that it was just steam coming up, but someone pointed out that they're-, they're, they're It's just water, I think. There. Okay, so it's just water well, to try to- The only it. thing that they add is um, an organic um, odor yeah, control. There. So the steam coming off could be from the, the heat of the pile. Mm -hmm. It could be coming from the liquid because it's there's liquid coming out of those top, what somebody called a boom sprayer. Um, those top yeah. little black things are, are letting some water come out. So I believe, oh, okay. I'm not positive, but I believe it's water with odor control, um, organic odor um, muffler or whatever they call it. Um, mixed in and they don't add any additives there's no chemicals it's all a natural process um and that's it great thanks yeah that helps clarify it and that makes sense you know we talked about water being an important ingredient and if these are exposed out in the sun you know you want to make sure you keep them especially after when it's not raining you keep them wet enough to have the decomposition be at a rate that exactly fast um so that's that's great and if you're ever interested, we made, we did in-person workshops at um, Clearview Composting last year, and people thought that was pretty cool to see a larger scale composting operation. We could, if there's interest, reach out, we could do that again. I yeah. We could get Rick to do that again this fall. Yeah, we're always scheming to do something in our group. <laughs> yep. I love it. Can I, can I pick out a question? Yeah, Joel? go ahead. Way, way back at 7.06 PM, um, someone asked, Amy Crane asked, do you dump it out and start again at some point? Um, so I didn't cover that um, in the earth machine compost bin that we sell and many municipalities sell this by the way. So if your town, if you don't know if your town sells a compost bin or a compost pail or a recycle bin, just call, call your town hall or your town department of public works, board of health, whatever department in your town handles solid waste matters and ask them if they have composting equipment. And if they don't, it's a great idea to very politely with a smile on your face, even if you're talking on the phone, re request that they look into it because as Ann noted, um, our own Ann McGovern who has a broken foot um, <laughs> <laughs> has worked tirelessly for the past 30 years to make sure that compost bins and pails are on state contracts so municipalities can go and purchase a pallet or a bunch of these um, items at cost at a very low cost and then pass that low cost on to the resident or maybe even give it to them for free. Um, anyway, so the earth machine has a door in the bottom so that you can lift up the door or take the door off and shovel out the finished compost because it does, you know, the, the soil, the heavier soil does kind of, I don't want to say fall to the bottom, but it ends up on the bottom and the leaves and things that haven't composted yet kind of float to the top a little bit. That's not the right word, but you get my point. Um, so yes, you do dump it out and start again at some point. Um, you know, some people do, some people just keep that bin going forever. You don't have to harvest it. Um, you could just, after a few years, if you didn't harvest it and it's getting too full, take some finished compost out. Um, and it, even if you don't have a garden, you can still use the compost. You can um, spread it on your lawn. You can put it under bushes, trees, shrubs. Um, you can give it away. Somebody would love to receive finished compost. A lot of people say to me, well, why would I compost? I don't have a garden. Um, and it's, it's totally not required. Also, when you compost, you're really minimizing the stuff. So you start out with X amount of materials and you end up with, with less. So it, it minimizes also. Totally. And it's, you know, all those benefits that we talked about at the beginning, those are still happening. You know, if, even if you don't use it, you're taking it out of the waste stream, you're capturing carbon, you're preventing it from becoming methane. Uh, you're, you know, ideally you're adding it to the soil, but that doesn't have to be garden soil, like she said. So um, right. there's lots of reasons to do it, even if you, you don't could, have a place to put it. 
You could give it away. Yep. Yeah, people would love to receive free compost. <laughs> Um, and there are several groups like Facebook buy nothing groups where you can offer weird things like that. And other weird people are glad to accept your weird <laughs> item. That's great. Um, <laughs> um, like <and> worms. <laughs> exactly. I looked for worms today on the buy nothing group. Um, so Anne typed in, if, you're, if your town doesn't sell compost bin, Boston Building Resources sells both types that are on state contract. Also the um, Eco Building Bargain Store in Springfield, um, which is run by um, the same organization that runs Recycling Works, Center for Eco Technology or CET. They sell a, bin, a big bin that rotates um, long wise. It's um, on a stand and it's like a 55 gallon drum with holes in it and it really turns, it's like a turning composter deluxe. So they sell those also. So there's other places to get them. Um, Greenfield Farmers Cooperative Exchange sells earth machines and you can find them at garden stores and online. And those Worcester County bins look awesome too. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Those are, are those cool. panels, are, how big are the panels again, Joel? They're one yard or one meter by one meter. So it's, you know, so you get decent a size. Cubic you can, yard. You get nice. a cubic yard. Yep. Uh, and you can add, we've also had people put two together. We usually zip time together. So you can have, you know, two cubic yards or two yards by one yard by one yard um, for people who want a bigger pile. Or you put two next to each other and you've got your leaves in one and your others. And, you know, it's kind of, you just sell by the panel and you can create whatever square structure you want. You know, some people will buy a square, a fifth one to put on the top to keep animals out. Some people just have it open. So they're kind of a versatile, useful and that's why we sell them and, and um, we got to order some more we're almost sold out cool and you could you could if you've lived in the city and you had a rat concern you could rat proof them with um hardware cloth which is yep. like the half inch mesh metal mesh that probably easy to attach to those panels so then you could make it really uh rodent proof yep and it yeah it's it's one inch um they're one inch square so they keep most things out but yeah rats smaller rats especially can be can still get in there sometimes so but raccoons possums all that stuff stay keeps out so um i guess for a last question i'm curious if we can talk about the ph issue because that came up a couple times and there was you know talk about wood ash um and um adding citrus peels and maybe we can ask amy or ann to comment on the citrus question because i guess for me my rule of thumb is like if I, I I was I never add too many citrus you know peels but I, maybe it maybe I could be so and what do you think well to me they um if you make if you have a mixture of things it's never I've never experienced it as a problem but occasionally I've read not to compost them and I'm not sure why but I don't bother um, worrying about it myself, but yeah. I don't know. How Maybe. about you, Amy? Um, well, citrus peels are fine. Um, I tend to see, I, at my house, I have a bin for the worm bin, a little bin for the worm bin. I have the regular bin for the, for the backyard compost. And then I have a big paper bag for the compost that I'm sending to Martin's farm. And I usually put citrus peels in that one. <laughs> nice but you can compost them in your backyard compost they will compost was that what yeah. the question was yep and i do compost them my kind of thing is like if we have like a, a gathering and there's been a bunch of lime peels you know from drinks and things like that if there's like a bunch at once i usually wouldn't compost them but when it's like just the occasional for use in cooking and stuff, I, I throw them in the compost. I just don't want to add like a ton at once. Or like when I lived in Costa Rica, we had a separate pile because we had fruit trees and we had tons of citrus waste and that would have totally thrown off. Our ratio would have been like half citrus and, and half everything else. <laughs> so that would have been no good. Um, so, you know, it's, as long as you're, it's a reasonable amount. And then, you know, I wonder if we're adding a little bit of wood ash or lime might, you know, reduce that effect. Or if you have a bunch of pine needles, for example, you know, if it just you if you've got acidifying agents maybe just balance it a little bit with a little bit more of a liming agent that's a good idea there you go if you use your wood ash add orange peels 
and lime yeah. peels. <laughs> I have a lot of lime peels too. With my worm bin, I um, I um, I freeze my fruit waste so that I won't be as likely to get fruit flies. So I have, unfortunately, I have a bunch of lime, half squeezed limes because I have my own cocktail party <laughs> during yep. the pandemic. Yep, I hear that. <laughs> So I'm giving, I put, but I do what you do. I put a few into each. I have three different worm bins so I can rotate around with them. And so, um, so I put a few in each one and so far I haven't killed them off. So I think it's okay. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Not having too many gin and tonics. <laughs> More mojitos. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's a good note to end on. Maybe the <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, and... yeah, yeah. The next, the next event we need to have is a compost cocktail party. How does that sound? There Sounds great. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can make some compost tea for people to put in their gardens. Um, I don't oh, know I if, if yeah. either of you have other closing remarks, but or other questions you wanted to answer before we take off. I just wanted to to briefly cover. Somebody's had a really good question about. If you're continually adding compost to your bin, how does it become finished? And Joel yeah. said, um, you can set up two, two bins. Um, and like in the, the video that showed, the video that you can watch, if you go back to the presentation, you can watch the video about how to build a pallet bin. And he has two bins side by side. So if you have the, the bin on the left is the active bin, you fill it up till it's just about filled. And then you um, you can either, if you have two bins side by side, turn the bin you're gonna start stop using into the empty side. That will add a lot of oxygen and um, you can amend it at that time so it can finish composting. You can add a few more leaves, you can add some water and then just leave it alone. Put a note on it that says X, don't use this and let that finish and then start using your other bin. And so you don't have to have two bins that are like big pallet bins next to each other to do that. You could just do this with two, you know, purchased plastic compost bins. Yeah. Um, and they don't even have to be next to each other because you don't even have to do the, the step where you turn it into the other one. You could just, I used to have my summer bin and my winter bin. My summer bin got interrupted by something. I won't go into that. Um, so I'm not doing that right now, but that is my ideal to have a bin I only use in the winter and a bin I only use in the summer. Mm. Good idea. Oh my God, there are 10 new messages. Oh, it's all the, They're all all the people saying thanking thank you. us. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And thank you, Anne, for joining us and offering your expert perspectives oh. in the Q&A. My pleasure. Oh. Thanks for having me and thanks for doing this. Yeah. And thank Great. you, everyone. Feel free to email us or reach thank out you. with more questions. And um, hopefully we'll be able to have some in-person programming this year, too, like we did last year. And um, we'll be in touch. Yeah, and, and sign up for our other two webinars that are coming up. Next one is a week from today. Yeah, that, for sure. Well, that, that should be some, some new information and specifics. So it should be good. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, great. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Anne, for being here. Thank you, Joel. Thanks, Amy. For running the, the Zoom yep. and getting back to people and doing all that part. And thank you, everyone who was able to join us. Yeah, and we'll, um, thank you. this will be on YouTube. So if you need to, as a reference, we'll put it on our YouTube channel, the Worcester County Conservation District. Nice. Great. All right. Have I fun composting, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Night, night. Happy gardening. Happy composting week. <laughs>